Thanks. I sort of feel like I should have a guitar here. Um, I have to say, you know, when it was snowing, I was thinking, wow, that's great, because now I have a really good excuse if only four people show up. So somehow you came out anyhow. I guess that's what a good, good economic crash will do. Um, <laughs> What I want to do is, uh, I, I won't talk that long because I want to have a lot of time for questions, but what I want to do is, is sort of quickly, first off, give sort of the basic story as what I see as the origins of the bubble economy, then say a little bit about the stock bubble. I, li I like to be bipartisan here, so I get to trash both Clinton and Bush here. So I'll say a little bit about the stock bubble, and then the housing bubble, and then uh, obviously a little bit about the collapse and what I see as some of the key issues going forward, uh, including the stimulus bill that hopefully the House will pass tomorrow. Um, so, okay, well, starting out, the, the, the transition, how do we get to a bubble economy? I think it is really important for people to understand that we didn't always have bubble economies. I mean, obviously, we had two very big, very dangerous bubbles in the last decade or so. But if you look to the post-war period, we had 30 years or so after World War II in which the economy had very healthy growth and really didn't have any significant bubbles to speak of. It didn't have significant financial bubbles. That doesn't mean there were never prices that were out of line. But you'd be very hard pressed if you look through the economy in the, the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and into the 70s to find any sort of very erratic movements in asset prices that really disrupted the economy. And to my mind, that was the sort of economy we'd like to see, that you had a situation where you had very good economic growth. The economy was growing rapidly. Productivity was growing rapidly. But it was broadly shared so that across the bo board, up and down the income ladder, you saw rising real incomes. Typical workers were seeing their wages rise more or less in step with productivity growth. And I'd argue that that's not an economy that's conducive to bubbles. That, of course, changed as we got into the 70s, and then most importantly by deliberately po deliberate policy changes with President Reagan coming into office in 1980. Basically, President Reagan adopted a, a set of policies that were quite deliberately designed to weaken the power of workers, weaken the power of unions, and to redistribute income upwards, and it certainly had that effect. So many of these policies, these are things we're all familiar with. Uh, it's certainly the weakening of unions. President Reagan quite deliberately tried to weaken the power of organized labor. He appointed people in National Labor Relations Board that were much more hostile to unions. Um, it made it much more difficult to organize. Um, everyone remembers the air traffic controllers. He fired the air traffic controllers when they went on strike. They really changed the norms of labor management relations because prior to the, the firing of the air traffic controllers, employers did not fire striking workers. It simply, you know, unless you're a renegade, it wasn't acceptable practice. The idea was that if you had a strike, you negotiated with your workers, you maybe operated with a skeletal staff, you kept some management personnel, but the deal was could you outlast your workers? Your workers weren't getting a paycheck. You weren't selling anything. That was the deal. That was the context in which negotiations took place. Immediately after President Reagan fired the air traffic controllers, there were a whole set of instances in which major companies, Eastern Airlines was one, uh, Greyhound Bus Company, where they fired their workers when they went out on strike. Totally changed the dynamics of labor relations. Going out on strike meant you could lose your job. It obviously made it a much more effective wep a much less effective weapon for workers, for unions against employers. Well, that was part of a larger set of changes that the Reagan, Reagan administration put in place that weakened the power of labor. It wasn't just the unions, um, trade policy. We had a trade policy that was quite explicitly designed to put, to put our manufacturing workers in direct competition with low wage, low paid workers in the developing world. And the predicted effect of that, the predicted and actual effect of that, is that it drives down the wages of manufacturing workers in the United States. And in fact, because manufacturing at the time certainly was a, the major pace, place of employment of good paying jobs for workers without college degrees, that had the effect of drawing, driving down the wages of workers without college degrees more generally. Um, also deregulation of major sectors like trucking, like the airline industry. Um, that also had the effect of weakening the power of workers in those industries. That was, those were places where workers, non-college non educated workers, had relatively good paying jobs. The high dollar, we had a high dollar in the 80s, I'll come back to this, we had a high dollar in the middle of the 80s that led to a large trade deficit. Again, that, that impeded, impeded the competitiveness of our manufacturing industry, put more downward pressure on the wages of manufacturing workers. So we had a variety of policies that weakened the power of working people in the country. And what it meant was that workers no longer were in a position to share in the gains of productivity growth. So this created the environment, or so I would argue, it created the environment in which you could have a bubble economy. 
prior to the Reagan era, you had a situation of this virtuous cycle where you had productivity growth translate into wage growth, translate into consumption, increased demand, increased investment, increased productivity growth, wages, et cetera. You broke that cycle when wages no longer kept pace with, with productivity growth, and you created an environment in which bubbles could grow. Okay, so when do we first start seeing the bubbles? Well, we didn't see any significant bubbles in the 80s. The bubbles first became an issue in the 90s with the Clinton administration. And I would argue that President Clinton pursued a policy, his, his key his central tenets of his macroeconomic policy, which was very conducive to a growth of a bubble, both his focus on deficit reduction and also his deregulation, or I call it one-sided deregulation of the financial sector. I'll come to the one-sided in a minute. His, the central tenet of President, President Clinton's economic policy was deficit reduction. We have to get deficits down. And many of you may recall, when he first came into office, he sort of was torn. We'll see how President Obama deals with this tension very shortly, I imagine. But he was torn between all these commitments he had made towards investing in people, putting people first, if you remember his platform. On the other hand, all the deficit hawks, led by Robert Rubin, who became his Treasury Secretary, of course, saying, no, we have to get the deficits down. That's what really has to be front and center. And of course, the deficit hawks were the ones that won out. He largely abandoned his public investment program, the idea of putting a lot of money into education, infrastructure, research and development, that was largely abandoned in favor of the deficit reduction side of the story. So what was that supposed to do? Well, the deficit reduction story was we get the deficit down, lowers interest rates, we're supposed to increase investment. And the increase in investment is supposed to make up for the lost demand. If we're, we're reducing the deficit, that means we're either raising taxes, which of course President Clinton did, and or cutting spending. He also cut spending. He did do both. Okay, so that's reducing demand. You make that up with increased investment. So that was sort of the classic story of what was supposed to happen. Okay, well, part of that did happen. We did get very low interest rates. So if you look back to the 90s, we did get very low interest rates. We did get some uptick in investment. But the real part of that story, what really happened and led the economy, the economic growth, which we actually obviously did have very good economic growth towards the end of the 90s, what really led that was the stock bubble. So we had a very low interest rate environment that was one that was very conducive for the growth of the stock bubble. And we saw that stock prices hit levels, ratios to corporate earnings that we'd never seen before, at least not since the 20s. I'm not expert enough on what the 20s looked like, so I couldn't tell you price to earnings ratios then. But historically, the price to earnings ratio in the stock market had been around 14, 14 to 1, 14 to 15 to 1. So stock prices were equal to roughly 14 times corporate profits. In the late 90s, that rose over, to, over 20 to 1 by 95. And by the end of the decade, it had crossed 30 to 1. Okay, this should have been easy to recognize as a bubble, by the way. It didn't, have to, it didn't take a great genius. A lot of people were surprised. They lost a lot of money. They probably deserved it, at least many of them. Um, but it, it should have been easy to recognize when you saw price-to-earnings ratios that got to these ridiculous levels in the late 90s. I, I'm saying this remembering that I had to argue with a lot of people because there were a lot of people who thought it was a great idea to put Social Security money in the stock market back then. They just said, we'll just put it there and we'll all be rich. Um, you know, but it should have been easy to recognize that you had a stock bubble in the late 90s, but for the most part, certainly the folks, uh, the policy people here in Washington, for the most part, didn't recognize that, and they continued to act like, oh, everything's just fine with the stock market. And for the time, through the late 90s, that was actually what drove the economy. So if you look at what were the sources of growth in the late 90s, there was a little bit of an increase in investment. So you actually had reasonably good investment. That story's exaggerated, because a lot of the, the Clintonites will like to say, oh, investment soared. That's not true. And I could tell you more carefully about why that's not true. But there was some uptick investment. Some of that was directly related to stock bubble. So for one, it was one of these rare occasions where stock purchases, stock prices actually led to investment because you had the classic story of companies selling stock, the internet companies selling stock and using that to finance investment. That's not usually something that happens. That did happen a little bit in the late 90s. But what really fueled the economy, the strong growth that we saw in the late 90s, was consumption based on stock wealth. 